Hello everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This machine is an HP 150, which is a 1983 desktop computer released by HP to compete with the IBM PC 5150 and XT 5160. While this runs MS-DOS and has an Intel 8088 processor, just like the PCs, this is actually not PC compatible. HP's first true PC compatible came out with the HP Vectra soon after this machine. This machine was HP's attempt to get a little bit of the exploding personal computer market that was really taking off after IBM released the 5150 PC in 1981. In exploring the HP 150, I have been intrigued by it because it's so similar in some ways to PC architecture, but in other ways so, so different. I've also found that it has some faults which are gonna need to be addressed. So let's get right to it. So the HP 150 desktop computer as you see here, it's got a nine inch green CRT inside. And if you can believe it, the actual computer itself is just this little section here on the top where the monitor is. In fact, if I lift it up, it comes right off the tilt stand. And yeah, what I'm holding in my hands is the entire computer. This middle section here is simply a tilt stand and it has a button on the side that allows me to tilt the monitor or the actual computer backwards and forwards. This on the bottom is the HP 9121 double disk drive unit. This interfaces to this computer and actually any computer you use this with using the HP IB interface. HP IB was HP's name for what was also known as GPIB on other machines and also is the same interface standard used for the Commodore PET to hook up its disk drive and other accessories as well. IEEE 488, if I recall. I'm not sure when this disk drive came out, and I think this might have come out actually a little bit earlier than this particular computer, the 150, because there were some precursor machines to this that ran the Z80 or Z80 processor, but this machine, as you see here, is running MS-DOS and is running an 8088 processor. Notice this computer is running MS-DOS version 2.01, and even though it is running DOS and it's running an 8088, this machine is not PC compatible. That didn't happen until the following machine after this, which was the HP Vectra line of computers, which continued many, many, many years. And that was HP's PC compatible line that could run regular PC compatible DOS and all the applications that went with it. The HP 150 came with this mechanical keyboard that has a somewhat unusual layout compared to PC compatible machines at the time, but it does feel very nice to type on. I've popped off a couple keys, so if you recognize what the key switch is, let me know. But the keys are a relatively nice chunky keys, although I don't think they're double shot. So the printing, which is sort of a purplish color, is on top of the keys. Some of the keys have double functions, like this user and system key here. And the extra shifted function is in a blue writing, as is the shift key to tell you that you need to push that to get that second function. Take a look at this section of the keyboard. It has the normal kind of up, down, left, right, but it has a home key that has an arrow that points to the upper left corner. Insert character, insert line, delete line, delete character. So definitely got some buttons that are different than a typical PC. Previous and next, a select key. Above the numpad are four blank keys. There's a clear line and a clear display button. And on both sides of the space bar is an extended character key instead of an alt key. Up here is a break and a reset key, and to reset the computer, you would hit Shift, Control, and that key, and it's the equivalent of Control, Alt, Delete. I haven't given this keyboard a thorough clean yet, and unfortunately, it was really, really dirty when I got it. Now, while it has a pretty nice sound, some of the keys don't work super well, and some of the keys are very bindy. If I push like the T up in the corner here, it doesn't really go down, it, it binds pretty badly. In fact, all the keys are doing that. I'm not sure if that's indicative of this type of key switch or if this keyboard is just so filthy that that's happening on most of the keys. This machine also came with an original HP mouse. 
It's an interesting shape, quite bulbous here, pretty uncomfortable, very loud button clicks. And it's just a typical ball mouse. And unfortunately here, you might notice the screw's a little bit rusty and that's indicative of this entire machine. It was exposed to a ton of moisture wherever it was stored. And unfortunately, some of the parts are rather corroded on the machine, but that doesn't seem to stop it from working. I'm not really sure what exactly the mouse is used for. Obviously it doesn't seem to do anything while it's plugged in and you're just in this text mode. But I did notice that there's a copy of Windows 1.03 for the HP 150 machine. But after doing a little bit of reading, it seems that you need to have an external hard drive that hooks up through the GPIB instead of the double floppy drive to use Windows 1.0 on this particular machine. You'll see here on check disk that it shows the machine has 256K of RAM in it. Unfortunately, there is a fault in this machine because it does have a RAM expansion board in it that should bring that up to more, potentially up to 640, but clearly it's not working. On the keyboard, if I push the system key, you'll notice here it shows service keys. And here's an example of the touch screen. I can actually touch those options and they are selected. There are some diagnostics to run here. And if I push memory test, right away it reports memory test failed 3F08. I've looked in the technical manual or was it the service manual for this computer? And essentially it says that any 3F code is a memory board problem with a logic chip on it and the entire board needs to be replaced. And uh, let's do system test. Testing. I turned off the studio lights so you can get a clear look at these incredible monochrome fonts. These HP fonts, which are also used in a bunch of other HP equipment like terminals and stuff like that, look so legible and readable on this monochrome screen. And one of the reasons why is they're not just bound by the normal pixel resolution, which I think is like 720 by 350 or something like that, because these actually use a half pixel shift. Here's a page from the manual that explains how that works exactly, but that makes incredibly legible monochrome type that is so sharp and unbelievably good looking. And you might notice here it says system test failed 000C. Sometimes like on power up, it'll say 100C. I think the 100C and possibly this 000C is due to the fact that there is no CMOS battery installed in this computer right now. So it's running the total defaults. Here's a side view of the machine and you can see that this top part, which is the computer itself, it's just so small and compact and then here, if I do the tilt stand, there it goes. It's just pretty cool how that works. So this is the actual HP 150 computer. Taking a close up look at the CRT, you'll notice these little holes that run all up and down the side. They're also along the bottom, both sides and the top. And what that is, is infrared beams are shot across and up and down on the picture. And when you stick your finger, it interrupts two of the beams, one of the vertical beams and one horizontal beam. And with that, the microcontroller or the little controller chip in here is able to tell where exactly your finger is on the CRT. Now, of course, the alignment of the image on the CRT is important because it doesn't know where that is versus these beams. So there's a test pattern that comes up with these little crosshair marks and you need to line up the CRT image in line with the bottom corners of the little sensor beams all the way along here. And once you do that, it's actually relatively accurate. When you move your finger around, it seems to track really well. On the back, this is where all the I.O. connections are, along with the IEC mains input, and there's an output as well, so you can plug in uh, like a printer or something else. So when you turn the power switch on, it will turn on that external device. There is a cooling fan grill, which actually I took out of the computer and I, have, I need to put it back in. There's some controls for the CRT. And then down here are the main controller boards, including two expansion slots. So there's one on the left and there's one on the right. And this card here is the RAM expansion card I had mentioned, along with the mouse port. This unusual looking port with two dots is actually where the mouse connects to. And it looks kind of like an RJ45. Right above that, the machine has two regular RS-232 serial ports, Datacom port one, Datacom port two. And then next to that, this is uh, looks like a regular phone jack connection. This is where the keyboard goes. This is the HPIB, which is also GPIB, or the one on the PET as well, all look like this. This is for connecting those disk drives and also other accessories. It uses a cable like this, which has, it's double-sided, so you can actually chain devices together. 
So you can plug something like from here into the disk drive and then from the disk drive into something else. And that's because each of these connectors has a male and female side on it. Now I had mentioned corrosion. Take a look at these connectors. Now I've cleaned this up quite a bit, but these were just a mess originally. I found a ton of mouse droppings all around this computer, especially inside the keyboard. So the corrosive P that really screwed up that Franklin Ace 1000 I showed on the channel kind of got to this machine as well. Luckily, they did not get inside of this computer. So there were no mouse droppings in here. The same goes for the disk drive, which didn't have an opening that was big enough for a mouse. Although there is an opening here, and if this were open, a mouse could have gone in there and made a little nest in here. But what this opening actually is for is the CMOS battery holder. And this takes two 1.5 volt little stubby looking batteries. You put them in here and then you slide this in and clip that in and then that's three volts uh, for the CMOS. Now, the reason why this is out is because of course they had leaked. They weren't in this machine when I found it, but they had leaked caused corrosion. Well, I've already cleaned up the corrosion in this, but inside there, there's the battery contacts on the main motherboard. One of them is all green and corroded. So I need to sort that out. I think I'm just going to probably install a CR2032 or something. And, and I don't know, I haven't figured out what I'm gonna do exactly. Now on the top of the machine, there's something that's really quite cool. If you push here, this actually opens up and then this cover lifts off as well, giving you this compartment on top of the computer. Now there's also a cable that normally sticks in here. And I guess um, when I put this thing back together, I had the cover off, I forgot to route it through, but it's a little ribbon cable just sticks through. And after looking at pictures, what it seems like this upper compartment is for is a printer. You can get a thermal printer that sits in this space and it comes with a new lid where the paper feeds through. And when you print, the printout just comes out of the top of your computer. I really have to laugh at that at that silliness. Now, I guess on this particular machine, you can just store cables up here. Um, let's see, let me put this down like this and you can close it all up. So I guess it's like a little storage area for your, maybe your GPIB cables and things like that. But um, yeah, it's up there, there's space and a printer can go there. Now, of course, in typical HP fashion, this machine is very serviceable. It's extremely well engineered like all HP stuff is. And um, the top cover here around the monitor and power supply comes off by releasing these two screws. And then you just lift up on it and the whole top cover comes right off. This is that ribbon cable for the printer that I forgot to route inside of the top cover. But, and this gives you access to the high voltage board. So this is what runs the CRT, of course. And on the other side is the power supply for the entire computer right here. So. They're not ex easily accessible due to the small packaging of this computer. But on the CRT board, there are some adjustments for the geometry of this picture, and you can get to them very easily by just uh, adjusting those control down there. And then to remove these boards, uh, first we'll take out the expansion card here. This is the RAM expansion board with the mouse controller port on it. So we just have to loosen these screws and that pulls the board out and there it comes. So this is it. So all of these chips here are 64 kilobytes. And unfortunately, everything is soldered. Nothing is in sockets, pretty rude. So on this board, each of these RAM chips are 64K by one bit. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's 64K. And then we have four banks there. So that's 256 plus another 64 and another 64. So that's another extra one of 28. So 256K plus the, the 256 built in the motherboard, that's 512 and then an extra 128 is 640. So this would be maxing out this machine to its full potential. Now I have put deoxid on the connector here and sliding it back in and it still gives that memory error. And the diagnostics do have the capability to kind of tell you which bank is problematic. So if it told me that I had a problem with the bank, I could look for a bad RAM chip, but it is telling me that the whole card is bad, which would imply it's one of these logic chips. Now, fortunately, this thing isn't just 74 LS logic, including this RAM, it has some PAL chips. And of course you can't test this without it being inside this machine, which has a backplane in there. So I don't really know how to diagnose this. And there's no, I don't think there's schematics that I like can find. Maybe there are, I just need to look up the part number, but like pretty crappy troubleshooting instructions. It literally just says, oh, you get that error, replace board. It doesn't tell you like, look for this chip or whatever, just replace board. Anyhow, on the main chassis, there are uh, extra screws that I've already taken out. I think there were four of them or maybe five. And then that lets me take out this entire thing. Let's just pull this out of here. There we go. 
And in here you'll see there's quite a bit of a sandwich. Now I know that this board here is called the mezzanine board. And this has extra RAM on it, or maybe it has all the RAM on it. And the board on the bottom is the CPU board. And that has the 8088 processor, and there's a speaker there, and obviously some other logic that, that runs this machine. And then this board right here is the second serial port board. So this stuff is all sandwiched on to the main processor card, and we can kind of see down in there. And then you notice it has this uh, large multi-pin connector here, which is what plugs into the backplane back there. And then in the machine, there's still one more board. And this, from my understanding, is the video board. So you have to flip these little levers here, and then it slides out. Come on. It's really stuck in there well. So this has a CRT 9007 controller chip on there. Um, I think these are either, these must be ROM chips, or maybe these are RAM chips, I'm not, I'm not sure. But yeah, so this is the video board, and right here, this is where the CMOS battery was connecting. And luckily the corrosion is minimal, like the traces are not damaged at all, but take a look at that post. Yeah, that's pretty green and, and crusty. The corrosion on there means if I clean it up with vinegar, it's probably just gonna expose uh, unplated metal, which will just oxidize and corrode again. So I may just desolder these entirely from here and then install that, that CR2032 battery holder made with a little bit of wire so that you can pull it out of the machine, install a new battery, and just sort of place it back in there. So I really enjoy how modular this computer is, but what I don't like is that it's really difficult to do any kind of troubleshooting because you can't access any of the system while it's running. Maybe there's a way to disassemble this entirely where I can take that back plane out, power it up from the power supply, and then have these cards at least outside of this cage. But I, I'm not quite sure. There's probably some crazy test jig that HP had with like these ribbon cables where you could plug it into the back of the back plane and then run the board outside here for troubleshooting. But when you read the service manual and technical manual, it does not explain any of that at all. It is fascinating to me that the machine runs fine with this install. It just gives that RAM error, and it does take a really long time to turn on. I assume it's doing boot diagnostics, but it's able to detect that there's a problem and just disable this board entirely, and then the machine is working normally just with reduced memory. This is so wild. I'm looking at these bodge wires, and for whatever reason, like this bodge wire here, it's it's replacing a trace that was there. So it goes from that pin up to here and around here. They've cut through the trace there and there, and then they installed a shorter bodge wire. Why? I think they did the same thing here. So this bodge wire there, there's a cut trace there, and it goes down and loops around, and it makes its way back to over there, and then they've cut that trace there. Why did they do that? Was it like too long to go around or there was a timing issue and they just had to do a shorter wire? It's This bodge wire is the same thing. They cut the trace there, they cut the trace there, and the original trace just goes like that and it's cut. One thing that's a bit disheartening, but it shows how expensive this whole thing probably was. A, it says it was made in the USA, but B, this is a six layer PCB. You see the one, there's a two, and a three, four, five, six. I think um, this uh, pin, this fourth layer is obviously a ground plane or something like that, but that's how they're able to pack so much onto this thing. And there just seems to be hardly any traces visible. Visual inspection, not to mention I did tone out all of the bodge wires to make sure they were still connected. And everything looks flawless on this board. There's no corrosion of any kind, no bad sorrow connections, everything looks great. Now, incidentally, the date codes on this thing are from 1985, so someone added this later in the life of this machine because on the main uh, motherboard on this thing, it's from 1983. And up at the top here, it says HP HIL slash 384K RAM accessory card. HP HIL, I'm pretty sure, is the interface for the mouse. That's what that's called. And in very typical HP fashion, every single chip, including, for instance, this regular old 74LS21, has an HP part number on it. Some of them, like this part here, is just 1820 dash 2075, I'm not sure what that is. I assume that's just a normal 74LS logic chip, kind of like um, this one up here, this 74LS244. But here is a PAL 16L8. So that's something, if this chip is bad, I can't replace that. Even the RAM chips have 18183059 part numbers on every single one of them. So I went ahead and removed this very green and corroded post, which was the negative terminal. 
And then I went ahead and installed a CR2032 battery holder. And the yellow black wire here is the negative and that goes back into the holes where I removed this post. And this one is soldered onto the other post, which is not corroded at all, which is the positive. And I've added a little extra length because I cut out the inside of this battery holder. And now you can just shove this in here like so, and then put this into the computer like that. So it's, um, that hole is not there anymore. This is the top cover and I just, I need to reinstall the fan, I forgot. And it's just gonna clean out this little bit of dust that's in here. All things considered, this computer is really clean on the inside. It originally had a Panasonic Panaflow fan. Um, it's 12 volts. Hopefully it's not too noisy. Oops, it has a rubber kind of um, grommet thing on here to keep it from rattling around too much. This sort of slides in like so into the holder. And then this plastic piece clips in like this, and that holds the fan in place like that. Hopefully it's not too noisy, but luckily it's a standard size fan. And the way it mounts in here with this clip, I could put a lower profile fan and it would be fine. Okay, before I fully clip this in, I just wanna see if the fan is working because it had a connector that was unpolarized or non-polarized. Yep, fan is running. I did run the cable through. So let's pop this cover back in. Okay, I've left the bad RAM card out for now. I wanna see if with the new battery installed, I've gotten rid of that 000C or 100C error that I think were was due to the CMOS. Okay, so it beeps. Oh, it came up pretty quick. Default configuration used. Hey, that's a great sign. Okay, so I'm gonna push service mode, service keys. Uh-oh. Oh dear, um, the touchscreen is not working. That's interesting. I wonder what's happening there. Let's go into service keys and I'm gonna do a system test. Wonder what's up with that. Oh, look, system test failed, 1000 now. Oh, come on, what's, what is going on here? So I'm doing the memory test here, which at least it doesn't immediately give that same error it gave before where it had that 3F08 error. So this is now obviously testing the memory. I must have four banks of 64K that comes up to 256K that's on that mezzanine card attached to the processor card. The fact that it's getting this far is a good sign. I guess that means it worked if it didn't show any kind of error. Hey, the, the, the touch screen's working all of a sudden. Interesting. So I wonder why it wasn't working and then now it seemingly works. So we're still getting system test failed 1000 though. But if I go touchscreen alignment, so this is that crosshair I was talking about for aligning the CRT to be lined up with the little sensors here. All right, well, I'm still getting these same power on test failures. So we're getting 100C, sometimes I have 1000. I actually have the that extra 384K of RAM reinstalled in this machine and I'm getting that still. But uh, it seems weird because when I look up these codes, it says everything that starts with a one is memory bank zero replace mezzanine card. But it's funny because once, even with those errors, I was going into the service mode and I was running the RAM test and it seemed to run through the RAM test without an error. That's when I don't have the extra RAM card installed. Let's see right now, if I do memory test right away the, with that extra card in there, it goes and shows that it fails. All right, I adjusted my camera, so hopefully you can actually read this right now. So I've gone under global configuration and one of the things that's interesting is you see it says power on computer. And if I hit next choice, there are two choices, either terminal or computer. If we leave it in terminal, when you power on the machine, it does not attempt to boot the operating system, which it keeps complaining about that it can't find the disk because I don't have the drive plugged in. And it ends up in terminal mode where it basically is just a terminal that hooks up to the serial port. We're looking at the port configuration in terminal mode and we can scroll through these different baud rates and we're at up to 19.2 is what this thing supports from 110 to 19.2. And so this can act like a, just a regular dumb terminal. This screen here, we're seeing the terminal configuration itself and lets you control the terminal ID, either 150 or 2623A, I guess two HP terminals. It does not emulate any DEC terminals, not without extra software, which you can run in DOS. You can also go to accessory configuration and accessory card one 
that's the card that has the mouse interface and the RAM, but a clicking this doesn't actually do anything. I, I don't know if you would normally even be able to get into that if that card weren't bad, but yeah, it's not doing anything here. Uh, there's some other stuff, device control. You can adjust the margins. I mean, I'm not sure what this stuff even does here. Margins, tabs, enhance video, uh, define fields, set enhancements. I mean, I don't even know what this stuff is. Security video, inverse video, blink, underline, half bright. Who knows what this stuff does? So I took a break from this machine to have some dinner and I was thinking about how I might troubleshoot the memory problems that this thing is having. And what popped to mind was DOS debug. Uh, if you recall my Franklin Ace 1000 video where I used the machine language monitor on the Apple II to figure out what the memory problem was on that machine, debug on DOS works exactly the same way. Now this is the master diskette that came with the machine for booting into DOS and it has no debug command. But I went and checked out the HP Museum website and I found a disk image for the programmer tools. So I've just stuck that in the A drive and like take a look, there's debug right there. So if I run this, that should allow me to at least poke around and take a look at what's going on with the memory. Now I do have the RAM expansion card with the extra 3884K installed in the computer right now. So it booted up and you know gave me an error and then if I do a memory test, I will get that um, 3 whatever 08, 3F08 error, right? So I checked in the service manual and I found the memory map of this computer. And starting at the bottom with all zeros, you have up to 4,000, which is the original built-in 256K of memory, which looks like you can use 232 because a little bit at the bottom is firmware, blah, 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 interrupt vectors, whatever, whatever. Starting at 4,000 and you go up from there, you have the 640K, well, the 384K on the RAM expansion. It goes up to A, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And see here it says use for 640k config, which is what's going on there. So I need to look to see what's wrong with that memory card. I need to check with debug what's going on in memory locations 4,000 through, well, one byte less than A0000. So let's do that. So first off, we can take a look at what's in like, um, you know, 2000, 2000.0. Oh, sorry, the keyboard is acting up. So this is just the onboard memory, the stuff that's built in the computer, and you notice there's like a bunch of stuff in there, which is normal. If we take a look at 3000, this is still the onboard uh, mezzanine type of memory. I just reduced the exposure a little bit. Hopefully that makes the green screen show up really clearly in the video. Anyhow, so this is what's left in the memory probably after the memory test. Now 3000, this is the built-in or the mezzanine memory of the 256K, it's not the expansion card. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do a test and I'm gonna fill this memory, the first 100 bytes of it, with um, zero, zero. And then let's take a look at what we, what we just wrote into memory. Okay, so there's all zero, zero. And let's do the same thing again, um, 300 to zero, zero, 100, and we're gonna put FF. And let's look at what we wrote there. And look, there we go, FF. So this part of the memory appears to be working correctly. Now let's take a look at 4000. So this is on the memory expansion card. Now, this looks a little unusual what's going on in here. Like, but I assume this is probably the beginning of the memory test. When it's starting to test the RAM, it will write some patterns into memory and read them back and make sure they look correct. And perhaps if they're erroring out, it sort of aborts partway through, and that's why we're not seeing what we see up there. Let's just quickly take a look at 5,000, which is uh, bank one. Sorry, 4,000 is bank zero, the first bank of the expansion card. 5,000 would be the second bank. Okay, so we're seeing a very similar pattern, right? Both of these look similar, but I'm actually noticing that they do not look exactly the same. And let's see if you spot it. See if you spot the difference. Okay, well, I'm gonna make the difference obvious because right away I see something that looks different between these two banks, which I think can lead me to figuring out what's going on. I'm gonna fill 4,000, I'm gonna fill the first 100 bytes of 4,000 with zero, zero, all zeros, right? Every bit is zero. And if we take a look at what we just wrote to memory, look at that. It came back as all zero eights. I'm gonna fill the same memory space 
first 100 bytes with FF, so all ones. And if we take a look at what we see here, look at that, that is coming back correct. But then we were getting 08s instead of 00. That implies a stuck bit. Now, right off the bat, I can't assume that this is bad memory chip in this bank. This could easily be, say, a bad LS245 on the card, causing that data bit to always be stuck and come back as a one instead of a zero, which is why we were seeing the 08s. But that's pretty easy to test. All, all I have to do is let me just fill what's uh, the first 100 bytes of 5,000, which is the next bank. I'll fill that with zeros. And let's take a look at what we see here. And there we go, we're getting back zero, zero. Let's do the same thing again, but we'll write FF and then we will take a look at, and then let's look at what's there. And now we have all FFs. So we got zero zeros and we got FFs. That implies that the LS245 bus transceiver that connects this card to the data bus of this computer is not faulty. There is only one of those. And if it were bad, we would be seeing that same 08 up in the 5000 here. So to validate that the rest of the banks on this card are okay, I just need to go through and do the same process on all of the other banks as well, all the way through 9000, and just to make sure that this test is working. And yep, we're looking at the 64K up around 9000, and look, it's still working correctly. We got zeros and we got FFs. Okay, so here's a little chart to explain what I saw. So I wrote 00, zero to that first bank, and I got back all 08s. And when I write 00, zero, I should be writing, well, I am writing basically eight zeros into memory. And when I read it back, what was happening is we were getting 08s, which would imply that this bit right here was actually coming back a one when it should be coming back a zero. So it implies it's stuck. That means that bit number three, now don't forget it starts at zero, so it's the fourth bit, but bit number three on the data bus is stuck in that bank. And the bank is 4,000, which translates into bank zero on the memory card. So unfortunately, I can't find the schematics for the memory card. I found another schematic for a memory card that goes in this computer that gives it 384K, but it's not exactly the same as the one I have. And I think it's because the one I have has that HPIL or mouse port on there, and this one doesn't appear to have that. And it really sucks that this is not the right schematic because if it were, I'd be able to tell exactly which chip is bad based on the chip markings on here. So bank zero is these top eight chips, and if we look for data bit three, so zero, one, two, three, it would be this chip right here, U54. Now here's the expansion card, and there are markings there, see U4243, there is no 54. It goes 49 and then it goes up to 410. Four. So it's almost like this is the fourth row of chips, third, second, first, and that's the way the U markings are. So the fact that the schematic here calls for U54 clearly means it doesn't match this card. Now the problem is, is th there's six banks of memory on here and I really have no easy way to know which is which because uh, this PAL chip here is probably doing the decoding, the address decoding that maps to these appropriate banks. So I don't really know like what's coming in and what's coming out of this, which would be which bank. Now, one thing I can do is I can figure out which data bit is which. So over here is an LS245 and that comes from the connector that goes into the back plane, right? And I can see exactly which is data bit three going into the 245 and I can find the pin number there that matches the 245. And then I can trace it through the 245 and to the RAM chips to at least figure out on the card I have, which would be the possible chips that could be affected. Now, how do I figure out which chip on mine is the bad one? Well, I think first I need to figure out which are the possible candidates. And then I'm gonna to try to look at the layout on the board and maybe I can figure out like a rhyme or reason to how the banks are organized on the board, the chips themselves. And, you know, figure that it's, it's I know it's bank zero, so, if there are six chips and they're in some pattern, well, it's gonna be the one on the very far left or maybe the very far right that would imply to be bank zero because I'm sure they're not just randomly arranged. It's probably zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, I figured out the candidate chips. So the signal comes in here and I, it's um, that pin right there. So from there to there are the data bits. 
that matches the schematics for the other memory card, right? Because the standard, this connector is standardized. And data bit three, specifically the one that I want is that. So that signal comes over and it goes to the left side of the TLS245. And then there's a corresponding right side. This is the side that faces the memory chips and whatnot on this board. So all I did was figure out from there where on these memory chips it goes. And it's this bottom row here. Every other chip is the data bit three. It appears that the chips are organized in banks of eight chips like this. So this is 64K, 64K, and so on and so forth. So logic to me would dictate, and I didn't lay this board out, so of course I have no idea what the designer had in mind, but I would think either this here is bank zero or this one is bank zero. And I'm gonna probably say that this one is bank zero because it's closer to all of this logic stuff and that bank uh, six, or sorry, bank five rather, is over here. But either way, it's gonna be that chip or that chip, most likely. Now the designer could have been evil and made like bank zero, one of these in the middle somewhere. I mean, who knows, right? But either way, I'm gonna start by replacing this chip over here. And if that doesn't fix it, I'm gonna go there next. And if that doesn't fix it, then I'm gonna have to keep replacing them chips. At least I know what's the bad bit, so I don't have to go and replace all of these chips. Okay, time to replace this one. Okay, I'm back and I haven't replaced the chip yet. What I did is I cut the old chip out. I feel that this is the easiest and safest way to desolder from this multi-layer board. Remember, this is a six-layer board. So I've just removed this chip and I'm just gonna pull each of these legs out one by one. But I thought what I could do to see if this was the right chip, if I did the right thing, is put this board back in the computer so I can test to see if I hit the right chip by just looking in debug at all of the banks. And if I got the right chip, then it should still be 4,000 that has a problem with the bit there. It just, I won't be able to write to it. It'll always be probably stuck or floating or garbage or, or something weird like that. But the others should all still work. Or if I hit one of the wrong ones, then I should start to see a problem in one of the other banks. And then obviously I'll still see a problem in the original bank. So let's pop this in and see what happens. The reason why I'm doing this now is because if I did the wrong chip, then I can just cut the other chip I think is bank zero and test again and keep doing that until I hit the right chip. And it's just so I can minimize the amount of time I'm soldering. I just basically do assembly length and do with all the chips and sockets that have cut off and put them back on. Otherwise, install a new chip and socket, test it. If that's the wrong one, I gotta pull it out again. And then I gotta go through the soldering and the cutting and all the testing over again and just keep doing that over and over again. And this way I'll just keep going until I find out which chip is the right one when I don't see any changes in debug. And then I can just solder all the chips at once. Okay, good news. I've gone through all the banks and I wrote 00 and FF into all of them from 4,000 all the way to 9,000. And I still only see a problem in 4,000. That's the only one that looks weird and it's exactly the same fault. I see 08 instead of 00. So that would actually imply to me that that original chip was simply bad. What's likely happening is that the LS245, when it sees a floating bus on the side where the RAM chips are, it just interprets that as a one, or maybe it's actually pulled high. There might be a pull-up resistor. And it's failures like this, which is why sometimes when you piggyback a chip, it works. And that's because the original chip's output drivers are bad. And then a new chip lying on top can just override it. If the original chip is like stuck, say it's stuck at ground, like it shorted the data bus, then that probably causes all sorts of other problems with all the other chips. But anyways, it seems like that original chip was just dead completely. And now I'm gonna replace it and hopefully that's gonna fix this memory board. So here's the bad chip that I cut out. Well, I, hopefully it was bad. And these are the pins that I then subsequently pulled out. And then here is the replacement chip installed in a socket on the board. Now it was pretty hard to pull the ground pin off. There's a really chunky ground plane on this entire board and it's obviously a really good quality copper and it just wicks the heat away so, so quickly. I ended up having to use hot air to heat up the board so I could get that pin out. So time to slide this board back into the chassis here. And you know, it's funny, there's plenty of clearance. So there's, there'd be no reason why HP didn't socket all those chips. Maybe it was a reliability thing. When you do have sockets, it, it is more unreliable, probably in the long run. 
All right, board is back in. Power up the disk drive. Make sure the cable's connected. Oops, the power switch is on the back. Now I'm still expecting this boot error that's gonna be like the 100C or whatever. I, I still have no idea what's causing those. I did poke around with debug at all the lower 256K of RAM and everything looks totally fine there. Although maybe there's like a bad bit just somewhere in there and I just need to look at it carefully, but I don't know how to find that. Oh, interesting, we have a different error. Power on self-test fail, 1004 now. I've never seen that particular error. I got this operating system error because I noticed that the disk drive wasn't plugged in. So let's uh, reboot the computer and try that again. Now here it is, it's booting DOS. This shows HP BIOS at the top there. And then this goes into something called PAM, I think, which is a kind of a program manager. It shows you what's on your disks. Oops. And then you would, you know, I pick the start MS-DOS executive so I can get to the command prompt. I switch the disk to the programmer tools. Let's go right for it. I'm filling 4,000 with zero, zero. Oops. Maybe if I typed it wrong, right, right, I mean, there we go. Here we go. Look at that. We got all zeros. So let's write FF into there. 100, and we're going to put FF. There we go, FF. That is looking correct. So I'm going to call up the system menu here, service keys, and we're going to do memory test. Oh, look, it's showing all the banks now. So without the card in there before, it was showing zero, one, two, and three. So that's four banks of 64K that, that built into the computer. And now it has four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, which implies the additional six banks. But the thing is, before I couldn't even get here, it was just immediately giving me that error. Interesting, it still says testing, but the numbers went away. So what's it doing now? Okay, that acts very similar to how it was without the card in there. Of course, operating system failed us because I don't have the right disk in. So if we go back to service keys and I do, so memory test was good. Let's do system test. There's that failed with the 1000. Why is there always just this random 1000? It's either 1004 or 1000 C or now 1000, it's ridiculous. Okay, let's go back into DOS. And the only way I really know how to see how much RAM the computer has, of course, is check disk command. Should show 640K. Oh, it does, look at that. So the card is fixed and this bad chip was causing that RAM card to fail and pretty lame diagnostics that it couldn't even tell me that there was a stuck bit on just one bank. What crap, crap diagnostics. Anyways, debug to the rescue once again. It shows that looking at memory directly with a debugger or a machine language monitor really can help you figure out your RAM problems. Goes without saying that this bad chip goes into the dead parts bin. Goodbye. So that just leaves me with these weird error messages. We got a 1000, I saw 1004, I saw uh, 1000 and C, and I also saw 000 C. So we're getting a whole slew of different error messages. If anyone has any ideas what these are pointing to, please, please let me know. But it's weird that the system appears to run normally. So I just don't get it. If there's really a failure with this machine, why does every piece of software that I run on here just work perfectly? It just makes no sense. All right, so this machine is now working. If I run the system test, there's no more failure codes. The RAM card is installed. Everything is looking good. If I run the power on test, same thing, no more errors. So I'm sure you're asking, what exactly did I do to get this machine working? Well, I was reading through the service manual and I noticed that it has a section on LED diagnostic codes. And there we go, pass the test, no issues. On the back of the machine, when you power it up, there are a series of LEDs that light up and they will show codes. 
I recorded it with my phone because they're really tiny, and then I wrote down what the codes were. So the way it works is there are six LEDs total. The first two are a binary counter. So zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. So that's showing you four nibbles that make up a total of 16 bits, which is one of the error codes. So the first one, I just wrote it down. The first nibble is 101, 001, 1100, and all zeros. And that comes from these extra bits, these lights that are on there. And if you translate that into hex, that gives you 91CO. And then there was a second error code being flashed. It, there was this one, a pause, and another one. And the second code came out to 2702. So if we focus on this first one, 91CO, in the back of the service manual, it has error codes. And 91CO falls within this range here, touchscreen failure of one or more LED pho photodiode pairs. So what I did to test this is I went into the config keys and I went to global config. So it's just a regular config screen. And the way this works is as you touch the screen, it moves the cursor around. Well, I use something like this to just move the cursor across the screen. And sure enough, right over here, there was one column that wasn't working. It was like somewhere in this area here. I identified it down to a single column and it just was not registering. The cursor would skip entirely over that. Well, clearly it was detecting that at boot. So I took compressed air and I put it down into the hole on the bottom, sprayed, did the same on the top. It didn't seem to fix it, but then I power cycled the computer, no more errors. In fact, no more errors of any kind. On the very first boot up, when I was recording these flashing LED codes, I got the same, you know, 1000 or 1004, or whatever area code, error code, the one I've been getting all the time booting this computer up. But it's weird that it was showing me that code because in the service manual, it makes it seem like the codes it shows on screen translate into the ones that you see in the back of the book. But the, all those 1000 codes all point to like RAM bank zero, replace mezzanine card. That doesn't make sense because any of those, any errors in that part of the RAM, I don't think would create a working computer. But anyways, once I cleared the air, once I blew air in there and I power cycled the machine, now that bad row is, is fixed. It now works fine and no more errors. So you may be asking, what was this second code, 2702? Well, according to the book here, 27XX was user RAM bank seven, failed RAM refresh test, non socketed component failure. Okay, so I thought maybe there was another bad RAM chip, but what doesn't make sense to me is when I fixed the bad row or the bad column on the touchscreen, there are no more errors. No more at all. Now, if I just power the computer off and I let it sit for a while and we power it back on, it will get no more errors. It just goes straight to trying to boot off the disk. I really can't believe that this 91CO, which pointed to the touchscreen, led me to, no, look there, see it booted, no errors. Oh, it's gonna say operating system not found in a second. But I can't believe that led me to blowing compressed air and fixing that bad column. And now the machine is working. I just, like those diagnostic messages were such nonsense. I can't believe it kept showing me these stupid codes that power up that really meant nothing. I really should have ignored those stupid messages and I should have focused on these error LEDs. So just know if you're working on an HP 150, take a look at the error LEDs and decode what they mean. Spend the time to do this because that might tell you exactly what's actually wrong with the machine. None of these BS codes that don't get you anywhere. Well, I think I'm gonna end the video here. I didn't honestly think I was gonna get this computer fully functional with all of the 640K but I guess I did. The documentation actually came in pretty handy. And then a little thinking, a little logic, I was able to figure out exactly which chip was bad and replace it. And then of course that strange touchscreen error that was causing those strange errors. I don't know what was going on there. If you're familiar with these machines and you recognize the, the crazy error codes I was getting, I'd love to hear about it in the comment section below. In part two, I'll dig into this HP 9121 dual disk drive 
and talk about these crazy Sony disk drives that are in here, which are weird and non-standard, and then show you how to get a GoTech drive working inside of here and getting the disk images working so you can get software running on this thing without any physical disks. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I would appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what you do, you can hit that thumbs down button, subscribe for more videos and get that bell icon if you wanna be maybe notified if YouTube decides to do that and put your comments and your suggestions down in the comment section below. I'd love to hear what you think about this interesting and odd machine. And that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.